Hi, my name is Dave Glover, and I'd like to walk you through some parsing techniques and some parsing capabilities within the NetWitness platform. This will be a multiple part video. Not quite sure how many parts we're going to do, but we'll start here with part one. So let's talk about log parsing in NetWitness. NetWitness has the capability to take basically any log file that is received by the system and parse it using multiple different techniques, whether we're talking about straight parsing, where it's just a straight syslog that comes across, or if you want to send JSON logs into NetWitness, we can deal with those as well. What I'm going to walk through is just a couple techniques that you can use to parse logs. We're going to start with a very, very simple one. One thing to keep in mind is that there are multiple ways to build log parsers. I could give the same log file to three or four or five people. I will get back multiple iterations that are done completely different, and for the most part, most of them will probably work just fine. With that, what I've done here is I've actually gone ahead and created or synthesized a log file. Very simple, it's just a list of key value pairs, but it's a good starting point to start talking about how NetWitness actually parses logs using the XML parsers, and we'll actually build a parser for this using the log parser tool that's provided by RSA. There are multiple ways to build this parser. We can use the log parser tool, which we will actually in this video, or we can actually build them within the NetWitness UI and do them that way, and we'll actually do that in one of the later parts in this series. But let's start here. We have a very simple log file. We have a date, time, we have a host name, we have some uh, identifiers, and then in this case we have all of our key value pairs. So we have action put, user, host, source IP, destination IP, source zones, and destination zones. So let's actually bring this into the log parser tool and start walking through how to parse something very, very simple like this. The first step we want to do is to open the log parser tool. This can be downloaded off of the community, and once you have it done, what you want to do is you want to create a new parser. The parser tool will then ask you for what's the device type, what's the class of the device, and where do you want to save it? And then, optionally, you can uh, point to a log file right here. What we're going to do is we're going to actually uh, name, it, name it a device. I'll just do something very simple as training, and we'll put this as a application server. And you can see from the list here, there's multiple different choices from firewalls to IDS to web servers, application servers, and so forth. But we're just going to go ahead here and pick the application server. I am not going to specify a log file at this point. I'll actually drag that in um, once we get the tool open. Where this is going to save it is, in my case, it's going to save it to C users Dave UDS. So what I want to do now is I want to click on Create. Once I do that, I'm now brought up here to the Log Parser Tool main window. And we can see a little bit of hints here, getting started. We can put in our log file at the bottom. So what we can do is we can grab our log file down here and we'll just copy it and what that does here now is it actually shows the log file that I put in and the designations here on the left are red dots they are undefined so there's no parser uh, for them which obviously is true because we haven't built anything yet when defining a log parser they're basically broken up into two pieces there's a concept of a header and a message the headers are what define the device type and actually will show the parsing engine how to get to the actual message definitions. This will make a little bit more sense once we actually start doing it. But typically, when defining a message ID, the way I do it is I look from the left and I walk right until there is a different value or something is different, such as if we look here, we have action equals put, action equals get, action equals post. So in that case, maybe what I might do is use that for a message ID. This is a concept that's a little that people struggle with a little bit at first when they start building these, uh, because you typically want to approach the whole thing as, as one unit, but that's not the case. We do have headers and, and messages. So let's actually go define a header. The way I like to look at headers is, again, walking from left to right, I go until things are different. So in this case, we have an action equals put. So what I want to do is I want to highlight the put and go click create header. So what that has done now is it's defined put as a message definition. And I'm going to have to go ahead and define that uh, as well. And we'll go through and walk through that as well. Again, keep in mind, this is just one way to do it. There are multiple ways, and we're going to actually talk about those in the next part as well. So now that I have the message ID highlighted, what I want to do is I want to go here after user or before user, do a single left click, do a right click, and set as payload. 
and we'll talk about that in a minute. That's actually when I actually get into the actual parsing piece of the of the message. What I'm left with here is the definitions here in the front. So we have our date, time, our host name, a little bit of fixed text, and then action equals. What you need to understand about parsing is that everything must be defined. The way our parsing engine works, it is a left to right token parsing engine. So what it's looking for is anything and everything that may change, you have to do something with. For example, uh, when we look at Linux processes, there are process ID numbers, PIDs. Those PIDs may be different uh, after reboot and so forth. And what a lot of people do is when they start building parsers as, as a new parser builder is they'll approach the parser as I'm only going to parse the things that I care about and I'm going to leave everything else alone. That is not the way that the XML parsers or the parsing engine works for these types of parsers. We do have uh, other types of parsers that, that do work that way, but that's not the approach I wanna take here to begin with. We'll talk about that again in one of the additional parts. With that being said, I need to account for anything and everything that may change. The first thing I need to do is I need to define the month here. So in this case, I can do a right click. I can go create variable. In this case, we could define it as one of the existing variables, or I just wanna use this as a, as a placeholder. So I'm gonna go H M O N T H H month. Uh, so the H there to me just means it's in the header uh, and then a month field. I'm not actually going to parse these. I just need to make them a placeholder so that as these logs come in, we'll look for a couple of placeholders and then some fixed text. So we need to go over here and do the same thing here. So we'll do H day and then we'll do H time. Don't be tempted. Try to consume multiple variables into one key. So what do I mean by that? Don't try to take December 28, 0001, 00 as one single variable. You cannot do that. You cannot have field delimiters within a field. What I mean by that is you have a space here between December and 28, a space between December 28 and the time, but then we also have spaces in between everything. In this case, you cannot have the field delimiters in the field as well. And there are special occasions, but we're not going to talk about those right now. We need to define each month, each day, each time. Now the my server here, that's going to be a host name, or it could be a server name or something like that. We're going to do something very simple, and we're just going to call this host name. My log underscore zero is a piece of fixed text. You always, always, wherever possible, want to make sure that you keep fixed text in the headers. The reason why I've seen it where there are just multiple placeholders and then message ID. What you end up with is your parser will start consuming other log files that you never intended it for. And then in that case, what's gonna happen is you're gonna have misparsings for other devices sending uh, logs in that your parser here will try to consume uh, and they won't parse at all, nor will they parse with the parser that they're supposed to. We're gonna leave this as fixed text. Once I do this, this blue create message lights up. And also, if I click my little green play button, what you're going to see is we've defined all of these different pieces and they're all orange. That means, hey, the header is defined and I don't have any defined yet. There are seven events that need to be defined. I'm going to go click on create message. This is where the actual parsing takes place. So what I want to do is I want to start defining out the different pieces. And it's nothing more than just a double click or a click and highlight. From there, I can do a right click, uh, create variable, and I want to call this as username. One thing to keep in mind, this is using the Envision variable names, not the NetWitness ones. But I don't know what the variable names are. Well, if you want to, you can click on View, Variable Names. And what that will do is that will show you the parser key, which is the variables that you're going to be using, and how they line up with meta keys. If we were to look at something like dadder, for example, dadder actually lines up with ip.dst. So in this case, I would be using dadder in the log message or in the parser. So let's go back here. We've got that defined as username. We have this defined as hostname. If you do mess up sort of like I just did there, you can just re-highlight it and do a right click and create variable. That'll work just fine. And then source address, click and highlight. A keyboard shortcut, which really comes in handy when you're doing a lot of these variable selections, is if you do a control K in Windows, that'll actually highlight everything. And from there, uh, that's a source address, so we'll do SADDR. Now you'll also notice that there are the list of variables that show up underneath. As you start typing, the IntelliSense will start to show you the different variables that you can pick based upon the key sequences that you're making. So let's go through here and 
and do something with the destination address. Again, the adder for that. We have some source zones and some destination zones. What we can do is we can actually just click in zone and highlight source zone, and then we'll do the same thing with destination zone. We can then give it an event category if we'd like. This is where it show up under event cat name within NetWitness, and we'll show everything that actually parsed underneath that. In looking at this, we have other messages that look very similar, but we see that they actually have a message of get. So let's go ahead and define those as well. I'm taking the long way around to actually show the principles, and then I'll show you how we can shortcut this quite a bit. We'll click on uh, the same thing. I do highly recommend that you use the same variable names for the same types of events. This host, don't put this into something else because we already have it parsed as host name. So we'll put that in as host name, and we'll just walk right through here. We'll do the rest of these. At this point, once you get the header done, which typically is the hardest part, but once you get this done, it really is just monotonous work of going through and defining all your different variables. So at this point, we actually have two of these done. You could actually stop at this point. If we stopped the gets and the puts in this specific order would be done. It would work from that point forward. One of the things that makes this a little bit more monotonous is that we do have some of these that are out of order. If we look here, we have username, host, source, destination, source zone, destination zone. Well, if we look down here at these other gets, this one here, for example, we have destination zone first and then host name. Things have come out of order. If you remember back to the beginning, we are an exact match token replacer parser that reads from left to right, which means the parser definition is looking for the literals in this order of user, host, source IP, destination IP, source zone, destination zone. In a case like this, there's a special thing that we can do. If we come up here to parser details, click on tag val, our entry separator, in our case, is just a space. Our value delimiter is in equals, and in this case, we don't have any value encapsulations. So we see name one equals value and name two equals value two. Once I get done building this message, so let me go back here to the message, you'll see that name value pairs will light up. So if I click that, and click Allow Missing Fields, reparse this, it now went through and parsed these other ones. Now these other ones are gets, so I have that definition here, and it was able to parse those even though they came in different order. This is one of the kind of cool things with tag val parsers or key value pair parser. It doesn't matter what order it's in, it doesn't matter if less fields are sent. So let's talk about these two different fields. Name value pairs, that says, as long as the keys are defined, it doesn't matter if you send me less keys or the keys are in a jumbled order, we will still parse them. We'll look for them. So we see here that, you know, destination zone is normally defined at the end, but in this one it came in the second, but it doesn't matter because we've defined as key value pairs or name value pairs. The allow missing fields. What that means is that you can send me more keys than what you have defined and will only parse the keys that we know about or the keys that you've built definitions for. So let's say, for example, that there was another key called something like source user. If source user was in the log file, we'd still parse it. Well, we'd still part the, parse the keys that we know about up top, but we would ignore that source user. If we unchecked allow missing fields and we sent source users part of log file, we wouldn't parse the log file at all. Typically, it's good practice that when you define name value pairs, you actually click on the allow missing fields as well. We do have post and login and log off that we have not defined. So what we would do is we would actually continue to define those if those were of interest. And then once I do that, I can at that point go to export resource. So let's talk about the ones that are here. The main ones we want to talk about are export parser, export resource, and deploy parser. The difference between those, if you export the parser, you will end up with a parser.envision file. Once you have that file, you will then need to go to NetWitness, admin, services, log decoder, config, click on the parsers tab, and click upload. Once you click upload, it will then take that parser file in. At that point, you're going to have to reload the parsers. So there's a little bit more of a manual process. Uh, so I don't typically use that one that much anymore. The other one you have is export resource. If I export as a resource, I will have a parser.envision.zip. You will then go to NetWitness, click on configure, click on live, click on deploy package. You'll feed it that zip file and you'll click next 
you'll pick the different decoders you want to deploy that parser on. Check, 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 and then click next, next, and then deploy. What that will do is that will actually put that parser on all the different decoders that you select. It'll automatically do a parser reload. Good to go. Both of those two options, you could do this offline. You could be sitting on an airplane and building these parsers, save these parser files. Then when you get on the ground and connect back up to your corporate network, you get to blow those parsers. If, however, you are doing testing, for example, and you just want to write this parser and sort of have the tool actually inject it right up to the decoder, if you click on deploy parser, it will then go ahead and ask you for the log decoder IP, the username and password. It will then take that parser and then send that up to the decoders, do the parser reloads, and your parser will then be active. At that point, this parser will parse all the puts and all the gets. Until we actually do the post login and log offs, uh, those would not be parsed. Those would show up as the device of training and no message ID, and they wouldn't parse. Actually, what you'll probably end up doing is seeing a bunch of word keys. If we wanted to go ahead and complete this, it's really just more of the same. Let me go ahead and do that now. So I have quickly here gone ahead and parsed out the rest of them. We can see that the different message IDs I have are get, login, log off, post, and put. Five different message definitions for the five different types of of actions that I have. At that point, I can go ahead and click save. And same deal. If I want to go ahead and deploy that, I could simply pick my uh, log decoder. Keep in mind, this is the log decoder, not the head unit. And put in my passwords and click deploy. At that point, we're going to get the deployment status is successful. And that parser is now live within NetWitness. So I think at this point, we'll stop here. We've walked through how to build a parser, the concept of headers and messages. I do not expect you to be able to take this one 20 minute video and go ahead and build a parser. At least it's a good start. Join me for part two. I hope this was useful. Thank you.